Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Anybody heard these sayings? Climbing the corporate ladder, working for the man, nose the grindstone, saving up for Taco Bell. However you want to describe it, we've all worked at one point in our lives, haven't we? Why do we do that? Have you ever really thought about it? We take time out of our lives that we will never get back to quote work. You take a 40 hours a week, you had 10 hours of commute time, that's roughly 50 hours of the approximately 100 hours that you spend awake each week. Roughly half of our, our lives, waking lives, are spent working. But for what? Have a roof over our head, put food on the table, have clothes on our body, of course, but it's got to be more than that. Other than simple necessities, what's the point? Why do we choose the jobs that we do? Simple necessities don't require a lot. Anthropologists, when they study hunter-gatherers, actually have found that they only have to work about three to five hours a day to put food on the table. It's not a lot. In this crazy world, it's more like 10 or more. I've got a job, and at times I can tell you, it is utterly stupid. <laughs> Deployed many good times. Days when politics, crazy people get in the way, they just make you nuts. I mean, sometimes you got a really hard time showing back up at work. And those names seem pretty frequent lately. So I got to thinking. This week was one of those times and I got to thinking about it. Why do we do it? What is the reason? And who do we work for, really? Well, we've only got one place to find the answers, right? So let's look at our instruction manual. Let's start at the very beginning. Man's very first job, straight out of the gate. Now let's set the scene. If you would, turn to Genesis 2, very beginning of the Bible. Genesis 2, starting in verse 8, it reads, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also is in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So that's the scene for humanity's first workplace. It's a garden filled with good stuff to eat, nice stuff to look at. Pretty good. Now, let's go a little bit further. 10 to 14. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second, second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hedekel. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. So other than good looking and tasty vegetation, it's got a lot of water, lots of resources, precious metals, stones, really nice stuff. And then we get to his first job, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. Pretty cool, right? God put Adam in one really cushy job. See, if you think about it, there was no weeds at this time. He could walk around eating things, plenty of water, lots of resources. Tend the garden is essentially try not to eat too much and don't poop so you don't step in it. It's a really good job. <laughs> now, this changes really quick, though. That honeymoon period of a new job, we all know that. It wears out fast, doesn't it? So let's take a look at what happens next. Turn to verse 8, 8 to 13. Very next chapter, read about what happens to the world's first, the world's first performance review. God to Adam, first employee. Begin the verse 8, Genesis 3, 18. 3, <laughs> three 8 through 13. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Okay. If you find yourself hiding from your boss, you know that performance well is not going to go good. <laughs> it's not going to be good. So let's see what, what actually it was. 
Verse 9. The Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? Now think about it. I would love my performance used to be like that. Think about it. Kimmel, are you there? Present, sir. Top performer. Go get your bonus from Smith. That's awesome, right? Easiest performance you ever. What? Adam should have aced this. All he had to do was be there. Let's see what he does. Verse 10. So this is Adam talking. And so he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Man, right out of the bat. A softball was pitched to Adam. He could have knocked it out of the park. And he swung and he missed. He's like, sorry, God, I heard you, and I ran away. I hid. You know, that's a dead giveaway. Your key performance indicators are not good that year. <laughs> Let's see what else happens. Verse 11. And he said, this is God speaking, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should, commanded you that you should not eat? So, since Adam flubbed up the first part of showing up, things get a little bit tougher. God asked some probing questions. Things get harder. It's kind of like if you're in a point of view and it goes, Anderson, did you do the one thing I asked you not to? Now, a reasonable response would have been, yeah, sorry about that. Can I get my stomach pumped so I don't die? But this guy flubbed showing up. Guess what he does next? Well, this question gets harder. And then the man said, that woman you gave to me, with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate it. So for those who have been in the workplace, so you might recognize the age-old sport of bus bowling. Quick, who can I throw into the bus that's heading my way? Sorry, woman. Got to slow it down before it gets to me. And off she goes. And yes, lady, guys have been blaming women for a very long time. <laughs> so let's see what happens next. Verse 13. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, the servant deceived me, and I ate. We all recognize that, right? Passing the buck. <laughs> the buck got passed all the way down to the snake crate. No one left to toss him on the bus, except for maybe some random animal toss him by. But God didn't question the snake. Since he both employees had messed up in the performance review, there's no reason to question the unpaid consultant. So, all right. Al's messed up the world's first performance review. Adam had one Really easy job, and he didn't do it. Couldn't do it. Not just off the mark, but so bad, Adam was hiding and then bus bowling. No ownership of the results. Buck passed. Partner tossed under the bus without even hesitation. So what do you think Adam's performance appraisal results would be in one of the companies around here? You're walking to Google or Apple or something like that. He walked out the door, right? Told let him not hit it on the way out. Let's see what the first boss God does. Skip down to verse 24. So he drove man out of the garden. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of the Edom. And a flame and sword was turned every way to guard the door, of the tree, guard the way of the tree of life. So yeah, Adam was fired from his first job and walked out the door. However, there's a twist to this. It's pretty interesting. Unlike human bosses, God fired Adam for his own good. Not out of anger or to place with someone younger before he retires and collects his pension. God did it for his good. Let's go back a bit before verse 24 and read what God does to, for Adam before walking him out the door. Let's go back to verse 17 of chapter 3. Genesis 3, verse 17. And this is God speaking. And then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. But the thorns, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, to dust you are, to dust you shall return. Now at first, that sounds like some human bosses we know, right? Here's your pardon gift, buddy. Ground's cursed, thorns and thistles sprouting everywhere, just for you. Work it till you die. I get out of here. <laughs> but 
even though that sounds bad, think about what God did for Adam here. Adam had a new job before he was walking out. He was working for his food before he was walked out the door. And yes, it may not sound fun, but what was Adam's condition at this point? Adam now, that he knew right from wrong, got in some real serious trouble. He knew right from wrong, so if he messed up, it counted. In the very next chapter, Adam's son Cain ends up killing his brother Abel for something Cain did, not Abel. It gets bad pretty quick. God knew that Adam can and would get into trouble real quick in this new state of things. So guess what he gave Adam to do? Adam's new job was hard. It took a lot of work, a lot of sweat to get some bread. There's a reason for that. All things that God does are for our own good and out of love for us. For an application of this, how many of you remember when it was like to be a teenager? I know there's some teenagers in the audience. Do you remember those times when your hormones were in overdrive? You felt like you were going to go nuts? And everyone finds a different way to handle that time. But for me, it was physical activity. In high school, it worked out a pretty good bit. I was lucky my brother set up a gym in the basement and got used a good bit. In college, I'd walk the soles off a parachute every semester. It's the only way to stay sane. That activity helped me stay sane and make it through those years. God gave us work to keep us busy and out of trouble. Hard work is good for us. God gave Adam direction for how to stay out of trouble, keep from messing up the next stage of his life before he walked him out of the garden. You can't do this anymore? God was telling him, but here's a simple way to make it through what comes next. God was a loving God from the very beginning. He was firm, but he loved Adam. He did want the best for him, even though Adam disappointed him. Now, hard work. It's good for us. It's the end of the story, right? Not by a long shot. Hard work is good, but how many of us have worked really hard at something and come up feeling empty, wasted, or even worse, used? Adam was just starting out, though. He needed some really simple instructions. He couldn't pass the review of showing up, so God had to basically set that bar real low to say, just do this. It gave him a clear, straightforward path. Kind of like a kid growing up. You master one thing, you can move on to the next. So, okay, we got hard work. What next? Then what? We have to look at what we work at, and most importantly, whom do we work for? Now let's start with who we work for. Turn to Matthew 6, 24, starting at verse 24. Matthew 6, 24 to 25. It begins at verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Now that funny word mammon. That's really just a fancy way. It literally means riches, wealth. You can't serve God in money. If we're working to bring home the bacon, we've missed the mark. We know working for a human who's just as fallible as us, pretty ridiculous, right? Humans will never fail to disappoint. Working for ourselves, so to speak, is working to bring home the bankroll. It's just as ridiculous. Money only buys things from another human, so we fall back to that paradigm of They'll never fail to disappoint. It depends on humans. So either working for our others or for ourselves are dead end missions. But if we don't work for someone or for ourselves, what does that leave? Verse 24 is a pretty clear call about that. This is the same as the call in Joshua. It's the reason we had the, the memory verse for today and the songs we sang. You would turn to Joshua 24, 14 to 15. Remember what Joshua says, choose for yourselves who you'll serve this day? This is one of those great verses in the Bible. Joshua 24, 14 through 15. And it reads, 
Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your father showed on the other side of the river. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Were the gods your father served on the other side of the river? Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Awesome statement from Joshua, right? Right there, that's the key. When we understand who the true boss is, the rest falls into place. Jesus pointed this out in Matthew 6. He actually says, remember, you can't serve two masters. When you work, if you're not working for God, guess who you're working for? The other one. Now, we do not work for food, drink, clothes, other trinkets in life. Now, we do need food. We do need drinks and clothes, right? You can tell by looking at me that I like to eat. It's nice. <laughs> I enjoy it. It's actually been a little bit too long since I did work out like I did when I was a teenager. But that's another story. What do we do? If we can't work for food, for humans, we're supposed to work hard. What do we work for? Well, Jesus also points this out for us. Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 6, 33 reads, But see ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek the kingdom of God. Got it. How does that pay the bills? I do like to eat. So let's figure this out. Let's turn to a wise man who dealt with the different facets of life in this crazy world and see what he says about it. Let's turn back to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 24. Now Solomon, Solomon lived everything. He saw all facets of life. And this is what he had to say. Ecclesiastes 2, 24. Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink, that his soul should enjoy the goodness labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. All right. Eating, drinking, God's good with that? I'm down with what Solomon thinks here. It's pretty good. Let's see what he also has to say. Turn to Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. So notice this. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Now notice this isn't specific. There's no list of jobs here, no list of things, no specific set of tasks. So whatever your hand finds to do, put yourself into it. Work it like you mean it. We kind of circle back here to hard work. Pretty much whatever we find. But we know who our actual boss is. So how does that make a difference? Turn to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verses 23 to 24. Colossians 3, verse, starting at verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily. As to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. God is who we serve, not fallible and disappointing humans. We are in God's hands. God cuts our payroll check. Our blessings come from God only. Now, if something happens at the nut house that we sometimes call our place of work, we're still in God's hands. He will always come through. He will always take care of us. He will always direct us down a path that is good for us, even if we have no way of understanding what that path is going to be and how it's going to turn out. We simply have to trust that it will end in good for us. And remember that at all times, He has come through, through for us over and over in our lives. We do not worry about food or clothing. We worry about God. And let Him take care of the rest. The Lord who made the universe, some food and clothing, pretty trivial, right? It's 
It's a small task for him. There have been times in my life when I didn't know what was going to happen, how things were going to work out, how are we going to make the ends meet. Well, God always came through. He always was there for us. We never went hungry. We never went out clothes. We ended up better off after those trying times than we were at the beginning. And that's how it always is with God. You always end up better as long as you trust Him. So for the conclusion of the lesson, work hard, work for God. The rest falls into place. It does. And it's amazing how it does. And you never know what your life is going to bring. How crazy that work is going to be. But as long as you remember, you're not working for somebody. You work for God. And everything that you do, it works out. So, one final part and thought for those of us who aren't as lucky as Jesse who retired recently. We've got to go back on Monday. Let's read um, Matthew 6, 34. And I don't have this up on the slides, so if you would just turn there or just listen in. Matthew 6, 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know, this verse means a lot on a Sunday. We are here. We're worshiping God together. It's nice. The evil tomorrow can wait. You have to pay God, attention to God today. And there's a trick to it. If we can remember that tomorrow, tomorrow works out a whole lot better. So, remember, we work for God and no one else. If you haven't been working for God and you need to change the direction, if you want to sign up for God's payroll, it's real easy. Your own a quick dip in the water. Very simple. As we sing the invitation song, or for any time of that matter, it's a great time to change over to working for God. Thank you for your time this morning.